Hi, everyone. I just wanted to uh, let you know we will be getting started right at the top of the hour. Uh, if you just uh, hold tight and we'll be started shortly. For those of you that are just filtering in, wanted to let you know we'll be getting started shortly. We want to give everybody a chance to get logged in. Thanks to everybody for joining us. I'm gonna give it about 30 more seconds. We do have a large uh, group of attendees today. I just wanna give everybody a chance to get in and get set up before we get started. All right, I believe we're going to get started. So I wanted to uh, welcome you all to our presentation this afternoon. We're going to be talking about new technology at, for new applications, specifically around printed automotive heaters. Uh, so thank you all for joining us. Uh, this presentation obviously is a, a collaborative effort between Chasm Advanced Materials and Butler Technology. All right, before we get started, I just wanted to give you some quick uh, housekeeping with the webinar. We wanted to let everyone know we are recording this today, so it'll allow you to re-watch it. Uh, it'll be posted on our social channels, YouTube. Um, so please feel free to share this, go back and refer to it. Uh, once we get that up and posted, it'll, be, it'll happen a few days after the, the webinar is completed. Uh, also wanted to let you know we are doing Q&A today. So please uh, submit your questions through the webinar tab. I'll, I'll take you through how that works. All of our questions are gonna be held to the end in the essence of time, and then our, uh, our two presenters will answer your questions at the end. If for some reason we don't get to your questions today, uh, we'll be able to reach back out and get in touch with you to answer it. Uh, also wanted to let you know that we do have a survey that will be going out post-webinar. Please, please, uh, if you can, fill that out. It helps us uh, know what information you need and also helps us to prepare more informative webinars. So the next slide will show you how to go ahead and submit your questions. So um, the GoToMeeting webinar, you can see at the bottom there is a Q&A tab. What you want to do is uh, to submit that, you want to hit that question mark button. You click the, click the question mark, it'll open up another box where you go ahead and type in your question. 
then you actually physically have to hit the send button at the end. So hitting return will just do a carriage return. That way I can see your questions and take them down and give those to the uh, two presenters at the end. Now we're gonna move on, introduce the companies and the, the presenters. Oh, but before we get started, here's one other thing. So just asking the question, what kind of experience have you had designing innovative automotive heating solutions? So if you wouldn't mind, let, let's keep this conversation going. If you go online and use the hashtag printed heaters, uh, you can tag Chasm, tag Butler Technologies, or either of the presenters. We would be happy to continue the conversation online with you after the webinar. All right, so to get started, uh, just wanted to let you know that the two companies that involved in the presentation today, first one is Chasm Advanced Materials. They are a leading developer and manufacturer of printed electronic materials and battery materials using proprietary carbon nanotube and ink coating technologies. Butler Technologies is a custom manufacturer of printed electronics. They're an engineering focused precision printer that works with you for design, prototype, and manufacture of your printed electronics. Now our two uh, presenters today, I'll start off by introducing Mike Wagner. He is the Chief Operations Officer of Butler Technologies. Mike Wagner has been with us for nearly 30 years. During his career, Mike has held positions in engineering, R&D, quality, sales, and a, a current senior manager. He spent more than 25 years working exclusively with industrial printing, membrane switches, and printed electronics. Mike is also on the board of directors with the Printing United Alliance, and also serves on the advisory board for engineering curriculum at Butler County Community College. Our second presenter today is Ken Klaproth. He's the Chief Revenue Officer at Chasm Advanced Materials. Ken has more than 25 experience, years of experience of success matching technically advanced products to market demand. Ken has helped companies both large and small achieve double-digit growth. He joined Chasm in 2019, bringing global expertise from leading sales and marketing organizations at companies including Desolitec, Elsevier, IHS, Intuity, Proficiency, and Siemens. Results-oriented and data-driven, Ken is the holder of two U.S. patents and believes electronics should be intuitive, integrative, integrated, organic, and most importantly, not seen. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Ken Klaproth. Great. Thanks, Jamie, and welcome to everyone who's joining us from around the world. I'm looking forward to having this conversation with Mike about some really interesting and fun things that uh, we're all working on. Well, preparing for this uh, presentation, Mike, I'd be interested to learn more about what you think. But when I first started thinking about the topic, the first thing that came to mind for me were probably the two things that come to mind for everybody immediately when they're thinking about automotive heaters. The first one is the familiar cabin climate control where air is centrally heated or cooled and then blown around the cabin. And more obviously, the thing that everybody sees when they're looking in their rear view mirror is the rear window defroster. And this uses a technology where embedded microwires uh, form a resistance heater that clears the ice and snow on demand. You're right, Ken, and those types of heaters have been around for decades and have served the automotive industry well when your car looked like the picture you see in front of you. Or even the modern vehicles that you might might look like this. Exactly. But uh, more and more cars today are taking on a tremendous amount of new functionality and they're looking more like this. And their interiors are taking on more technology with more convenience so that they look kind of like what you see in front of you. And even though much of this technology may not be seen, their operation needs to be flawless, working the first time every time. The consumer's use of smartphones over the past couple of decades have con conditioned them to experience or ex expect uh, touch to control operations. So you're seeing these same type of smart surfaces being incorporated into automotive interiors. 
engineers are rethinking climate control as electric or hybrid vehicle battery capacity as a premium. Instead of heating or cooling air to blow around the entire cabin, engineers are developing heated surfaces to get them as close to passengers as possible, such as steering wheels, heat, uh, heated seats, uh, body panels, things of that nature. Of course, styling is very important, so all these surfaces have to be aesthetically pleasing as well. Yeah, that's a great point, Mike. And even the notion of what constitutes a vehicle is changing as the idea of uh, autonomous vehicles is starting to mature. Some manufacturers are approaching autonomous vehicles as simply an extension of the traditional passenger vehicle, such as uh, Volkswagen with the VW Buzz like you see here. And Ken, still others see opportunity in locations already having a dense population with traffic congestion, with autonomous vehicles being designed for urban multi-passenger transports like the uh, Amazon Zooks robotic taxi. And still others are reimagining their vehicles to transport more than just people like Kroger with their Neuro, creating a new category of special purpose autonomous delivery of vehicles. Exactly, and the, the uh, innovations don't stop there. When you consider that uh, vehicle cabins can also be customized for special purposes, autonomous vehicles such as the one being described as a self-driving market from a company by the name of Robomart can enable autonomous vehicles to bring fresh groceries to consumers where they need them. Uh, this also helps to uh, the innovation by decoupling the need for having supermarkets to be clo in close proximity to populations. And while all of these autonomous vehicles we've discussed so far do share some, sy some system requirements with evolving passenger cars, there's one huge difference. There's, there's no human driver in these vehicles. So without having the instant decision capability of a human at the wheel, when they need to intervene in case of emergency, um, their ADAS system must re reliably and always differentiate between a pedestrian and something like a pothole. These systems require an array of sensors to gather the amount of data required and the emerging sensor technology of choice across all of these vehicles for awareness of the surrounding environment is rapidly becoming optical cameras and for good reason. Exactly. And to understand why optical cameras are an attractive option for ADAS systems, you really only need to look to the prosumer drone market from a company known as Skydio. If you haven't seen these guys, you really should check them out because they're accomplishing some amazing feats of engineering, even if you're not a drone fan. So they build this as a drone that never crashes and it uses six fisheye cameras, the kind that you find in cell phones and real-time environment mapping software to build a virtual understanding of its surrounding. And all of this is coming from a thousand dollar drone. And they can do this at speeds up to 36 miles per hour. So this is the type of technology that you see extending everywhere and why it's an attractive choice for ADAS systems. While some of the autonomous vehicle concepts that we discussed may be a few years off, I'm sure you'll all agree that none of these are certainly your father's Oldsmobile. There are several operational issues uh, and even current vehicles where direct and transparent heat could overcome some of these challenge. Many passenger cars today, like my wife's uh, Subaru Forester, are using optical cameras for ADAS systems. Cars are also facing issues with LED headlamps icing over or simply looking for more mileage from a single battery charge. The ideal heating solution to solve these issues would be capable of being shaped to the stylized shapes common in modern vehicle designs. They would be transparent to optical or other frequencies so as not to interfere with the various sensors that are enabling these modern safety systems. And there would be one that delivers a uniform, consistent, and non-disruptive heat to keep inclement weather from putting safety systems offline. So in this slide, you'll see, you know, just the plethora of different uh, areas of a car that require heaters. 
And if we go through a few examples, um, you know, there, there's heaters integrated in the interior cabin wall. So that's something that would be a, a new application for a heater as opposed to just the typical heater core blowing hot air uh, based off your engine heat. Um, initially, with these vehicles coming on board, electrical vehicles, hybrid vehicles, they have lithium ion batteries and they lose half their rate of capacity at 32 degrees F and won't take a charge below 19 F. So this translates into a, a loss of about half the, the range of your electric vehicle in some cases. So we need heaters, and there are heaters, to, to basically you know, keep your batteries at a, a temperature that makes them efficient. Um, also, you know, looking at all these different types of, of heater applications, we want to look at you know, replacing some of these, these heater technologies with printed heaters. So what you'll see in this slide is some of the current heater technology, and there's many more than this, but you know, a, a fixed resistance heater such as a, in an etched copper uh, circuit on a polyimide film, so an etched copper heater in your mirror to, be, to basically defrost or defog your mirror. Uh, micro wires in your rear defroster, in your, in your uh, rear window. They're typically either ceramic, silver ceramic materials printed and baked onto the glass, or they're a series of very fine wires or carbon fil fil fibers embedded within glass, or in a case of maybe a heated steering wheel uh, embedded in fabric. And then you'll see probably, you know, more commonly, something like a positive temperature coefficient or a PTC heater and fixed resistance heater. But there's an example of a, a PTC heater in the third diagram, and that's a, a seat heater. And those are have been around for a little while in, in, in vehicles, uh, and they're typically printed on PET film um, other other heaters of this type can be printed on polycarbonate film if, if the application requires that. Um, we've even done some heaters um, on a DuPont Kapton or a resistive film. And then there's many more too, as well as things like uh, thermoplastic polyurethane is a newer substrate uh, for, for printed heaters that's thin, flexible, and even stretchable to some degree. And really what I want to focus here is the, the aspect of a printed heater. So, so what are printed heaters? In my definition, they're described as one or more simple heating elements, uh, screen printed onto a thin, flexible, and even sometimes stretchable material. They, they utilize resistive heating elements rather than wires or coils. They are produced using an additive process, unlike an etched or a bladed option, and they offer safe, reliable, and uniform heating. Again, elaborating a little bit more on the, the printed heater types, we have typically a fixed resistance or a positive temperature coefficient, or PTC. In the first picture, you'll see a, a fixed resistance, and typically those are very, just basically a common element, either a silver or a, a carbon silver blend, maybe something else. But it kind of works like, you know, the, the idea of an old burner on your stovetop or in your, in your oven. You're basically putting current through a resistive element, and it heats up. And those are typically constructed of something, polyester films common, again, polycarbonate, polyimide, thermoplastic polyurethane, as I mentioned, and then uh, DuPont Kapton RS film and clear conductive films. And then the, the diagram below that one is a PTC heater. And that one, you can see the uh, resistive carbon elements. Those are all the, the tile-like looking features on that with everything else being uh, typically printed silver bus bars and electrodes. And then the, those carbon elements heat up, and the silver bus bar distributes the power through there. On the next slide, we'll talk just a little bit about the uh, screen printed fixed resistance heaters. So, again, the heating elements are silver, resistive carbon, or a carbon silver blend typically. And these types of heaters, just like wire heaters or closed loop, uh, require a closed loop feed, feedback and control system. So basically you're going to temp sense if that heater's reaching a certain temperature based on maybe environmental conditions. And then there's a device coupled with that with digital control logic that'll control and power up, power down the heater. So you can kind of see the, the wattage on the diagram as the heater uh, heats up and cools down, your power cycles on and off. These typical operating parameters for some, a, a, a heater of this design would go anywhere between minus 40 F and 400 degrees F. And there's differences, you know, that's just kind of a general rule. And these are typically, 
used in more of a higher demand performance application. So because they get typically hotter than some of the PTC applications. In many cases, they require less ink or fewer print step than the, than the PTC heaters. Um, but one, one disadvantage I see as we talk about some of these new applications is in automotive, especially the disadvantage of being uh, constructed of inks and materials that aren't transparent can cause issues if you're trying to heat headlamps or something like that. And if we go on to talking about a little bit about screen printed PTC heaters, PTC is a called is known as positive temperature coefficient. And basically this effect is the resistance increases exponentially as the heater warms until the threshold temperature is achieved. And you can kind of see that um, in the resistance magnification diagram, the top diagram there. Um, as the temperature increases, you'll also see an increase in resistance. And what this does is as the heating elements increase in resistance, they start to choke off the current flowing through there, causes those elements to cool back down. So this continuously goes through a cycle that's limited by the threshold temperature of the ink. So this is able to basically self-regulate and it's able to run on an open loop without any external diagnostic controls. And again, I mentioned that the heating elements are typically resistive tiles printed or made of PTC carbon ink. In the, the printed PTC heaters, we see that they, they quickly reach their desired temperatures. In, in some of the cases you'll see in examples following, it's about 40 seconds. Um, again, typical mass, maximum threshold temperature range for the inks, and different inks are designed for different threshold temperatures, range from about 25F to 180F. And again, depending on who the ink manufacturer is, they have slightly different ranges for these types of inks. Um, and you can see in the bottom diagram, the red line is the temperature rises quickly and then tapers off onto the, into the equilibrium temperature. The power is very high initially, but then drops to its equilibrium. So actually, it's drawing more current initially, and then it drops off. So you, you get some power savings uh, once it reaches equilibrium. Again, the same disadvantage applies. The uh, inks in this case are typically non-transparent. So if you need some a heater that's transparent, you're not gonna get that through the, the PTC ink. So he's, here's a couple of examples. There's a PTC heater demonstration. It's screen printed on PTC film, and it reaches its equilibrium in about 40 seconds. Uh, this video is time lapse, so it's about three times as fast. It reaches in about 13 seconds. And then the next one is a fixed resistance heater. This is actually a uh, screen printed heater using a resistive film. It's a DuPont Capton RS film, so it's a polyamide film with a uh, resistive carbon side to it. And we print bus bars, for example, and then isolate zones using die cut slots or printing dielectric to isolate the different heating zones. So in these cases, you'll see that Capton RS, it's, it's opaque, it's black. It heats up very nicely, but what happens if I need a similar type of product, but it has to be clear? So that's kind of where I want to introduce Ken Klaproth and have him talk a little bit about technology that will address that problem. Great, thanks, Mike. I didn't uh, realize there were so many different options and technologies available for heat, but uh, as you mentioned, the, there's a, a variety of different uh, constraints that are involved with the heaters that you select. Uh, and the question then becomes, well, what happens when your heat needs to be felt but not seen? Uh, before we talk about the variety of commercial alternatives, let me first introduce you to the idea of a new category of transparent conductor known as a CNT hybrid. This combines all of the benefits of the materials being hybridized and also removes their implicit limitations. There are many materials in the world that are transparent and there are many materials in the world that are conductive, but there are precious few that are both transparent and conductive. Uh, all transparent conductors need to balance the conflicting constraints of transparency and conductivity. Increasing the conductivity typically means adding more of the base conductor which then lowers the VLT or increases the haze. The CNT hybrid overcomes these traditional couple and let me explain to you how. What you see here is a uh, scanning electron microscope of a carbon nanotube hybrid or CNT hybrid. Uh, this one actually, we've done a light coating of the CNT so you could see the interaction between those. In practice, the um, CNT ink would encapsulate all of this so you wouldn't be able to see it. 
Uh, but what you see is a combination of a silver nanowire uh, film that's been coated with a carbon nanotube ink. And the silver nanowires are the solid rods or the white rods that you see on the screen. This is much like uh, if you were to take hard spaghetti and drop it on the counter, the, the uh, silver nanowires lay down on the film in a random pattern. Some of them are crossing, some of them are, are disconnected at the ends. Um, but everywhere there is not a, um, a rod or, or conductive, the conductive silver, there's an open space. And this open space is non-conductive by definition. And in between all of those, you see this kind of wet spaghetti looking carbon nanotube uh, uh, ink layer. And the carbon, nanotube, the carbon nanotubes themselves have some really, truly remarkable properties. Uh, carbon nanotubes are conductive. They're also self-assembling. So if you put carbon nanotubes near each other, they kind of intertwine like spaghetti and they self-assemble into networks. Uh, carbon nanotubes being made of carbon are also environmentally neutral. So anything a carbon nanotube surrounds, it then becomes environmentally stable. Uh, so any of the silver uh, will become uh, protected from environmental instability. The interesting thing is because carbon nanotubes are conductive, now these open areas that were previously not conductive are now conductive. And if there is a break in the silver nanowires uh, or if they um, break from flexing and folding, then the carbon nanotubes provide a conductive redundancy. Uh, so actually what you'll find uh, with the carbon nanotube hybrid is that you can get better optoelectronic performance uh, than the, the base conductor itself. But one more uh, thing to keep in mind is the approach that we use in, in creating these uh, uses a very straightforward and um, mature manufacturing process of screen printing. So if you actually compare the cost of making a, um, a printed circuit from something like ITO and something like a carbon nanotube hybrid, the printed uh, circuit that's available uh, through the carbon nanotube hybrid is actually much more cost effective. So you end up with better performance, it's more robust and it's more conductive, uh, and it's also more affordable too. So looking at the alternative, the commercial alternatives that are available for a transparent conductive film, uh, there are several others that are on the market uh, that provide some level of flexibility and formability. And there's primarily three other options that are commercially available. There's the silver nanowire film alone. There's the metal mesh film alone. Uh, and there's another type of conduct, uh, transparent conductor that uses carbon nanotubes, a special kind of carbon nanotubes called uh, the carbon nanobuds. So as I mentioned previously, the, the, the silver portions of either silver nanowire or metal mesh are, are very conductive, but in order to get the conductivity that you might need, you need to add more silver. So by adding more silver, uh, they become less transparent. Uh, all of these materials as well, require some kind of um, encapsulant to prevent them from uh, uh, tarnishing or corroding. Uh, so to do that, you need to put an encapsulant on there. And as soon as you put an encapsulant on it to make a, pattern, uh, a circuit pattern out of it, you need to use some kind of an aggressive process like photolithic etching or laser ablation. Uh, the, making them environmentally stable requires this dielectric coating. And so their, the ability to flexible, to form these or, or flex them uh, becomes increasingly difficult. And I'm sure you're familiar with the, the new foldable phones that are on the market from Samsung and Huawei. These were using a silver nanowire film. And both of the in, introductions of these uh, had some failures associated with people opening and closing uh, the, um, the phones. The carbon nanobuds themselves are, you know, feature uh, carbon nanotubes, so they can be um, environmentally stable by their nature. And they, because of the carbon nano to, uh, nanobuds are carbon nanotubes, they do encapsulate uh, and um, um, self-select into networks. But unfortunately, like what we found when trying to make a CNT only solution, in order to get them conductive enough for these applications. You need to put so much, so many carbon nanotubes on there, carbon nanobuds on there, uh, they then start to uh, become hazy. So actually the carbon nanotube hybrid, as I mentioned previously, we can take advantages of the um, advantages of the, the silver um, films, 
uh, plus adding enough carbon nanotubes to give you that uh, carbon redundancy, but not so much that it negatively impacts the, uh, the, the visibility. So the, the CNT hybrid solution, we believe, is the clear choice when you need to make something that's both transparent, conductive, and something that's flexible and formable. So how do we make these? We start with a film. In this case, it's a silver nanowire film that's uh, coated completely with silver nanowire. We use a CNT ink to create any pattern that we want. And wherever the film is exposed, we run it through a mild etchant within a couple of seconds. It removes all of that silver because it has not been uh, coated with a uh, some kind of an encapsulant. So instead of needing something ag aggressive like laser ablation or a photolithic etching process, a mild etchant uh, is enough to remove the silver where we don't want it. And you're left with a, um, a circuit that's uh, immediately usable. There are three different versions that are available. Uh, we purposefully tune the recipes that we use for particular applications. There's a 75 ohm version, there's a 30 ohm version and a 10 ohm version. The 75 ohm version is nearly transparent. So that's uh, great for things like uh, touch screens or, or touch buttons. The 30 and 10 ohm versions carry much more current. So those can be used for heating applications as the current capacity uh, re increases or the heat capacity increases. Uh, then you would turn to like the 10 ohm version, uh, which is what most of the automotive heaters that we're working on uh, provide to our customers. Uh, each one of these uses a simple process to, to pattern. Uh, it's so simple, we have a three-step process. We call it print, etch, and done, because once, you're, once you do those three steps, you have a usable uh, transparent circuit that's produced at scale for, at very affordably. So let's talk about a couple of applications. Uh, here's an application for a commercial truck where the customer was looking for ice and snow control. So if you've ever seen the television show, Ice Road Truckers, these are the trucks that need to deliver every time in the Arctic and in blizzard conditions. Uh, the lens in this case was curved in three dimensions, but the curvature was really kind of a, a gentle three three dimensional curve. So it was gentle enough that we laminated a polycarbonate heater to the inside surface as a demonstrator. Uh, it was designed for a resistance of 14 ohms at a voltage of about 15 volts DC. And so that was drawing about uh, one amp of, of power. Within seven minutes of, of powering on, as you can see in the curve on the right hand side, the uh, front side thermocouple reached 40 degrees Fahrenheit above the ambient temperature. This, and that was about 105 degrees total. Uh, this was actually through the full thickness of the lens. At the same time, the heating film on the inside surface of the lens reached about 145 degrees Fahrenheit. In about 13 minutes total, the heater had reached a steady state at about 115 degrees Fahrenheit on the outside and about 160 degrees on the inside. The customer's design target was to hit this temperature in less than 15 minutes. So they were thrilled that uh, we produced the result in, in half the amount of time. So here's a thermal image showing uh, that heater in action. As you can see, the heat distribution is very even across the entire element with no hot spots. And unlike microwire, you don't have to overpower the wires so that the empty spaces in between will eventually catch up. And this is completely transparent to optical cameras as well. So customers are understandably skeptical about an innovation like a CNT hybrid. So we offer a standard demonstrator heater so they can actually see it for themselves. Here's an example of one of those heaters uh, reaching 40 degrees C within four minutes and a steady state in about eight minutes. We've even had an automotive uh, glazing company, glazing supply company, uh, ask us for a heater to reach 120 degrees Celsius, that's 240 degrees Fahrenheit. And I'm not sure whether their plans were to vaporize ice or to fry eggs, but it does demonstrate the capability of a CNT hybrid in heating applications. Uh, the the uh, CNT heaters that we've been able to produce, CNT hybrid heaters, uh, can even produce densities, energy densities in excess of about 3,000 watts per meter square. 
So offering the superior optoelectronic performance of uh, higher transparency with class leading conductivity needed for high performance heating applications, we believe that CNT hybrids are the clear choice for the best, best printed electronics that you'll never see. When it comes to automotive heaters, transparent or otherwise, uh, I hope you learned something new here today in an entertaining way. Uh, particularly about how the right technology applied in the right way can help you solve your own design challenges, require uniform, consistent, and non-disruptive heat. On behalf of Mike and myself, I'd like to thank all of you for your attention during the presentation. I hope you found it interesting and the information useful. As uh, Jamie mentioned early on, we've been collecting up any questions and we'd ha be happy to answer any of those questions, uh, starting that were any that were submitted during the session. If you have additional questions, be sure to submit them using the uh, chat window or the question window on the, on the GoTo platform. And as Jamie mentioned earlier, if we can't get them to, to them live today, if we run out of time, we'd be happy to follow up after the webinar or if there are questions that are uh, too complex to answer in a, in a short, uh, uh, session here, then uh, we'll follow up with those as well and provide additional documentation if you'd like. So with that, let me turn it over to Jamie. All right, great. So we do have a few questions. Um, I'm going to go through them. The first, one of the questions we got was, can we get a copy of the slide deck? And uh, yes, we will make this available to the attendees and distribute after the meeting. And I, I did mention at the very beginning, this will also be put online. They'll be on our YouTube channel, so you'll be able to, to review and take a look at the presentation afterwards. Um, so the first one, Ken, I'm, I'm, this one's gonna be for you. We've got a couple of questions in here regarding, can the, um, can the materials be uh, injection molded, uh, insert molded, thermoformed? Yeah, that's a great question. And if uh, people are looking at the camera, here's an example of, of one of the thermoformed samples that, that we've done. Um, typically what we do is produce them in a film and then that film polycarbonate film is either pressed into position or molded into shape and then it's uh, over molded with uh, thermoplastics. Uh, we have a variety of development projects that we have going on with uh, uh, OEM suppliers to the automotive industry uh, so that's the approach that we would use for that. Okay. Uh, also a question, is there an MSDS and PDS available for the CNT hybrid? Uh, yeah, those are both available on our uh, website and we'd be happy to provide them if uh, you, uh, anyone who asks that question will get your uh, uh, email address from the chat panel and we'll send those to you too. But if you go to our website, you'll see uh, on the uh, CNT hybrid section, the printed electronics section, there's a links that you can download those, those materials. Okay, uh, another question here, it's a multi-part multi, multi -part question. What's the purity of your CNT hybrid and is it single-walled or multi-walled? May we ask how much CNT do we need to use for battery materials, heaters, sensors? Uh -huh. Okay, uh, so uh, average purity, um, so let me, I'll do the easy one first. We use single wall carbon nanotubes. Those are conductive and we can control the, the purity of those. Uh, we offer a variety of purifications uh, for different applications, but the uh, purity of the, the carbon nanotubes that we use in the CNT hybrids for printed electronics are in the 90 to 95% range. Um, we offer other hybrid materials that are used as battery additives. Uh, and those uh, we heat purify for certain applications up to 99.99% purity. So it really depends on whether you're using them as an additive in a battery uh, or if you're using them for additives in um, uh, polymers. We, we have formulations for those as well. And we hybridize different uh, types of particles too for those certain applications. I hope that covers the range, and uh, if you need more, I'm happy to send you some of the, the literature as well. Okay. Um, let's see, we had another question here. 
Can you comment on what applications require very high template temperatures? You mentioned you went up to 400 degrees C, and I, I believe there was also a question that ties into that. What did you print on to get up to 400 degrees C? So is that a question for me, Jamie? Yeah, I think that's uh, you, Mike, because uh, the yeah. highest, we, we haven't been up to 400 degrees yet. Okay. So yeah, for example, you, yeah, so for a printed heater, you can use Capton RS film. That actually goes even higher than that. Um, and a lot of times those are used for applications where you're trying to heat liquids, for example, industrial heaters, but they can be also used on cars as well. So something like that application, we're taking that film and designing a heater based on its properties, which is 100 ohms per square, and printing you know, a conductive silver pattern of bus bars and, and electrodes to create the heating zones. And then it's laminated with, with uh, in that case, it'd be a Capton film that can take that temperature as an insulative uh, layer. Just a follow-up question that this one was, around that truck uh, application, but how, how do you measure the temperature of the film for these applications? What, do you, what kind of measurement device do you use? Uh, so we use a uh, electronic thermocouple. Um, it's adhered on the inside and the outside surfaces, and we can put them in a variety of different locations. And uh, as the heater heats up, uh, we're in real time pulling the uh, uh, temperatures off with a, uh, a measurement device. Does the uh, does the CNT print pass 100% uh, cover over the um, so there's no exposed silver so is it a complete coverage? Uh, yeah, good question. The um, so for most heater applications, um, it is 100% coverage because you want even consistent heat throughout. Um, but uh, if you imagine a um, uh, a headlamp that's uh, more stylized, you might have a, um, a bus bar that goes off to the side that has an interesting shape to get around different obstacles. So in those cases, when we're creating the, um, the heater, the CNT ink would be printed into the shape that included those bus bars, then the sil it's silver is typically added to the bus bars. And then we use some kind of a blanking uh, process. A lot of times we use a laser to cut, cut the shape out. Uh, but most heaters uh, do have 100% coverage, but if there are particular reasons why you want an aperture hole in the middle, um, we cannot print the CNT ink in there and then etch away uh, the, uh, the silver in the, in the center as well. So that you can create you know, very uh, intricate shapes using a, the screen printing approach, um, you know, down to 100 micron features and 100 micron gaps. Okay, great. Uh, there was also a question regarding, do you have marketing material PDFs, slicks that we can provide to potential customers? Yep, those are all available on our website and uh, we can also email them to people who uh, request through the, uh, the chat session. Okay, uh, next question is, what are the appropriate dimensions of the silver nanowire? The approximate dimension, sorry. Ooh, uh, so we we have a uh, supplier that we use. We give them a recipe to create those. I'm not sure of those off the top of my head. I, we certainly have that in our, our uh, technical data sheets. Uh, it's certainly something I can follow up with. Sorry, I don't have that off the top of my head right now. Okay. Um, another question. So what other uses outside of the automotive do you see for this product? Uh, other uses. Uh, it, it's funny. I uh, there, there are some interesting uh, customer examples that uh, uh, come up from time to time. Um, we have commercial um, uh, refrigeration companies, like the ones that you see when you go to get ice cream in the grocery store. You know, you open up to take a look, and then you close, and it's all fogged over. Um, there's there's companies that uh, we're working with that want to control that. Um, we're working with industrial uh, equipment manufacturers who have um, you know, processing equipment that's used in uh, harsh environments. And so they want to provide a, a transparent heater over the top of their uh, control systems, their HMI controls. So if you imagine like a big kiosk that's in uh, for a uh, water desalination unit that's, uh, that's running in the, in the Arctic, they want to be able to keep that clear so everything works. 
Um, another one that I had actually had no idea of until they, they came, uh, I had no idea what um, a farrowing crate was. A farrowing crate is used for livestock. Uh, in this in particular example, the farrowing crate was for pigs. So if you imagine a metal uh, crate that has bars in the center, uh, there's a big section in the center for the mother sow, and then along the side there's there's room for piglets to actually uh, suckle from on the mother. But what they want to do is keep the pigs at a particular temperature so they they um, mature properly, uh, but they want them to be transparent so they can see through and make sure that everything is okay. I had no idea what a farrowing crate was, but uh, this customer came to us and, and wanted to do something that was transparent. The heaters that they were currently using were radiant heaters. And because they had to put them over top of the piglets, they couldn't see the, the, the babies as, uh, as they were maturing. Uh, we've also had companies that do um, livestock uh, transportation that wanted to have heated floors uh, in those. So the, the applications really range. And it's any time you know people want to be able to control environment or provide even heat. Um, we had a, a, a train company. They have security cameras that they use. Uh, plus, they also use cameras to track, um, you know, point down on the tracks to measure things like speed and, and any obstacles that are on the tracks. Uh, they want to be able to make sure that those are clear during operations. So they wanted transparent heaters to go over there so that the, their um, operational cameras continue to, to work. Okay, great. Um, so here's another question. Of the various substrate options that you're using, do any of them create constraints for the applications that require transparency? If so, what properties would you want improved? Uh, yeah, so the, we, Typically don't find that there's uh, an issue with the transparency. We, we offer a range of them and sometimes PET is good for people. Sometimes polycarbonate is good for people. Um, the, we work with our suppliers of both the metal mesh and the silver nanowire films to choose the, the substrates that people will most often use like any manufacturer. Uh, we're trying to offer the, the right number of selections uh, without having, you know, um, SKUs in stock that aren't that popular. Um, the, uh, I, I would um, recommend to people to, to look to the um, substrates that uh, provide the uh, characteristics that are um, appropriate for your application. Uh, one application where we're getting a lot of interest where we don't have a solution right now is one that's high temperature enough uh, for um, soldering. Uh, so we're looking at our roadmap includes a high temp version for soldering things like um, you know LED continuous LED films. Uh, so if you wanted to have a long string of LEDs with transparent wiring that's being used, uh, their op their manufacturing operation includes picking and placing the LEDs and soldering them into place, robotically soldering them. So that's uh, one area where we don't have a solution right now, but uh, we're working on that. Mikey probably has some good suggestions when it comes to things like uh, PTC heaters or other types of heaters. Okay, uh, we've got a question here. Mike, are you muted? Yeah, I was just gonna follow up with uh, Ken's question or, or comment real quick. You know, um, as I mentioned in the presentation, there are, you know, we can print on clear substrates, but we're, we're using, you know, silver inks, carbon inks, right? So there are areas where they're not transparent. In some cases, you can make a, a, maybe a fixed resistance heater that has a thin coil printed in silver that you can kind of uh, have some or enough light or, or visibility through that. But in general, I think for those applications where you really want to want to see through, pass light through, you, you really want to look at these clear conductive films from from Chasm. All right, Mike, here's another one for you. What type of electrical connections are suitable for the thermoforming injection molding of these heaters um, in order to simplify the connection with power source? So the, the ones we've been most familiar with are basically um, male posts, male header posts that are basically integrated right into the molding process. That's, that's the most common we've seen. Mm -hmm. 
nothing too fancy, but that's that's what's out there right now. And then you plug your circuit board directly into that, you know, if you're gonna, or, or you can pigtail to that, depends on your application. Yeah, that's similar to the work that we've been doing with a variety of different customers. Somehow they get a bus bar off to the side where either a, a spring compression, uh, some kind of a rivet, a clamp connection, uh, or even a bayonet connection for some of the um, uh, headlamp examples. They actually have some conductors that are off to the side that as they assemble them into the, the base unit and screw the, the uh, cover into place, that makes the connection. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Ken, another question for you. Do you know how these heaters influence the automotive radar signal? Are they transparent to the typical wavelength of these radars or do they absorb some of the signal? Yeah, so the we, we do have a variety of uh, recipes uh, that we use for uh, things like radar. Um, radar is sensitive and carbon nanotubes can interact with uh, radar signals. So there is some tuning that we need to do there. Um, but things like optical cameras or LIDAR, it's uh, completely transparent to those. Okay. Just kind of buzzing down through some of these questions, trying to get to all of them. Um, here's one that says, I heard about hot spots at CNT copper contact points. Do you see such hot spots with the CNT AG hybrids? Uh, no, I don't. We we haven't seen hot spots, and generally speaking, we, that's part of the design process. You know, we are a materials uh, company. We provide the materials to people, and we do some prototyping to make sure we we, we don't manufacture, um, you know, production uh, quantities of the heaters for people. We work to figure out what's the right design uh, for customers, and then we have a variety of partners like Butler. Uh, that we we work with in order to get you know, manufacturing at scale for people. Uh, during the design process, we pay particular attention to the connection point or the bus bars so that the heat is evenly distributed and it gets to the temperatures that people need. Uh, we haven't had uh, any uh, hot spots associated with the, the bus bars because we designed for that in advance. Um, we do a, an extensive QA process of the films themselves because if the films are not coated evenly or if um, there's a discontinuity that uh, happens during the you know, manufacturing of the film itself, those can uh, manifest as hot spots, but uh, we can QA those out before we start to um, make the end units themselves. So generally not a problem with the connections because, you know, Forewarned is forearmed, and we take a little uh, uh, care in advance to make sure that doesn't happen. Okay. So we've talked a lot today about the automotive heating. We've got a question here about, is there any issues using this in airplanes for heating surfaces for cleaning or in between flights? Uh, no, the, there's, in fact, we are working with, uh, an organization, I'll call it, um, that's looking to take our heaters and put them on windows that are actually going to go into outer space. Um, so the you know carbon nanotubes are one of the strongest uh, materials on the planet. They're environmentally neutral. Um, they self-assemble into networks so that uh, once they're kind of uh, cured in place, they're extremely durable. Um, for uh, applications that are going to require harsh environments, we typically laminate those onto other uh, substrates or we can put uh, additional coatings on top of them if they're going to be aggressively um, uh, exercised or interacted with. Um, but again, it's more a, a matter of kind of understanding the operational conditions and then just designing for them uh, proactively. Okay. Uh, another question here, is 90% transmission considered adequate for windshield applications and headlamp covers? Uh, yeah, so the we're working with uh, a half a dozen OEMs and tier ones and tier twos on a variety of different applications in automotive. Uh, many of them are trying to solve the problem of a transparent heater for, you know, starting in luxury markets. Um, but uh, 
initially the the qualification process is always you know the the OEM does some bench top testing to make sure that they're getting the performance and the transparency and the conductivity that they need and more importantly in the automotive industry there's a heat up time that they need to hit uh, for safety reasons um, I know the automotive or the uh, European standard is ECE 43 I'm not sure the U.S. equivalent, but there's a certain time frame where um, the ADAS systems need to be activated. Uh, once that's done, they, uh, typically what they do is intro introduce us to their glazing supplier because the glazing supplier typically has design responsibility for things like uh, uh, windshield heaters. Uh, so we haven't had um, an issue like I, I know the the um, there's a Volvo, a model of a Volvo that has a microwire heater that uh, people have complained about in certain lighting conditions. You can actually see the wiring. Uh, that's a, a really big concern, but we we haven't had um, any issues uh, with people complaining about the the level of transparency, and particularly in headlamps. In headlamps, it's more about you know the, the light transmission, where it's not really about you know visual acuity. Uh, mm -hmm. But in the in the windshields, there it's at a distance, you know, much like a a window screen in your house. If you look out the window, you're not uh, seeing the window screen. At the distance of a windshield, um, it's it's visually imperceptible. Okay, uh, I've got a two part question here, and and we're running short on time. I'm going to be able to take a couple more questions just to let everybody know. There's also a, quite a few questions in here about wanting to receive data and data sheets. We will get back to you after the meeting and, and get you any of the information you need. Um, the next piece of this was, uh, what's the widest and longest print pattern that Butler can do? And then what's the biggest transparent area that we can do without seeing bus bars? So I can take the first part of that for sure. Um, so our print capability is we can, depending, it's it's really material and, and heater design type dependent, but we can do images uh, of 30 by 50 inches. So if, you know, you can do easily do a resistive heater that big, a fixed resistance heater, um, PTC as well. And then we, can, we can't fabricate quite that size. So we're probably closer to, you know, 30 by 47. Again, you have to find material that's that big if it's a specific type of material. So sometimes that limits what we can do with, with heater size. Um, and if not, they have to be chained together somehow if you need a really large area. And as far as the uh, the agent materials, the, trans the carbon nanotube hybrids, uh, we do produ produce the films in rolls. Uh, the current width is a meter wide. Um, so the Agent 10, for example, is printed on a, uh, roll coded on a meter wide by, you know, thousands of, of meters long. Um, if you were going to produce the, the heater by screen printing the ink, then you're limited to the size of whatever you can screen print. And as Mike described, you know, Butler is one of the companies that we work with that has a, a bigger print capability. There's another option uh, that uh, we're working on to have the CNT ink pre-coated at the same time as we're coating on the silver. And in that case, what we would be able to do is roll out a length to whatever was needed. And then you, what you would do is then print, uh, flexo print uh, or you know, screen print in, in steps, a bus bar on one side, a bus bar on the other side. And then you could have any length in between. But right now our, our limiting width is a meter. Um, we haven't really had a, um, a call to go above that, but the the uh, producers that we use to create the films themselves do do have the capability to go to a two meter two meter roll when the time is right. Okay, great, thank you. Well, at this time, I want to I want to wrap the uh, the presentation to an end. I want to thank everyone for attending. We we appreciate you coming out. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Any of the ones that I didn't get to today, we will get back to you and, and answer your questions. In the meantime, continue the conversation with us on LinkedIn, Butler Technologies Incorporated and Chasm Advanced Materials. Uh, be sure to use the hashtag printed heaters. So uh, on behalf of myself, Chasm and Butler Technologies, we'd like to thank you for attending. Have a great afternoon. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Appreciate it.